good morning, everybody. We're going to get started uh, just a second here. I know that we still have some people joining. And um, again, thrilled to have everybody coming back on our second morning of our conference sessions. Uh, yesterday was uh, really great sessions, really pleased with the presentations that we were able to share. Really, really great questions that we heard from everybody. Um, and just as a reminder, um, if you have questions during these sessions that uh, we're not able to answer, a great way to try to uh, see if those can be addressed um, is after the conference, uh, we're holding our office hours, which is on Friday, October 1st, uh, 9 to 10 a.m. Central. Um, open to anybody. It'll be a Unlike this, uh, it won't be a webinar uh, platform. It'll be just a meeting platform. So people will be able to um, just be on camera if they want to. Uh, if not, just be on audio, just to ask their questions. So uh, it'll be a lot more informal. Um, so that information should be shared in the emails that you're getting in the morning, just with your general uh, link information for the conference. It's also on our website for the conference. And uh, related to that, as we mentioned yesterday, uh, continue to use the Q&A feature. That is um, really the way that we're um, taking questions and also answering them. Um, chat is not monitored in the same way. So uh, if you have a question there, we, we may not see it. So please do. Um, use that Q&A feature. Um, I also wanted to um, just acknowledge, again, all of our sponsors that have helped to make this conference possible. And as you saw this morning, we also had uh, so many of the photos that uh, you as attendees submitted as part of the registration process. We really appreciate that. That's so great to see. Uh, I just love seeing those scroll by and seeing the folks who are attending and, and um, joining with us in this um, in these presentations, we do really miss being able to see your faces. Um, though we will admit that this virtual platform, as we've all experienced, has allowed us to um, welcome so many more and be more accessible throughout the state. Before we move into our session um, this morning, I did want to also follow up on something that was mentioned yesterday um, in the presentations, which was the DHS OCI um, Healthcare Coverage Partnership. This is something that some of you may be familiar with, others may not. Uh, I think Nathan Hodak had mentioned it specifically. Um, and I wanted to share some information about how, if you're interested, you can join any of those platforms. Um, let's see, I think I should be able to share my screen. So if you just give me a moment, I'm gonna share a slide. So um, this is something, this is, uh, so Covering Wisconsin is involved in this healthcare coverage partnership. Um, this was started in 2019. Um, and this slide just is a very uh, quick, this is something that Covering Wisconsin put together, so this is not officially coming out of the partnership, but I did want to um, share some information about it. Um, so it's open to anybody, anybody in the state can join. These are opportunities to both collaborate with other stakeholders around the state, um, but also uh, opportunities to more directly share or an opportunity to share information, um, another venue to share information to OCI and DHS as they uh, participate in all the different um, forums and work groups that you see here. And so there is a um, quarterly meeting or a forum that's held. The next one is coming up on October 25th. Um, and if you are interested in just being on the listserv for that so that you get the information for those meetings, um, that uh, you should contact Sarah Smith um, with OCI. Um, but there's also opportunities to be more actively involved um, on specific topics. 
And as you see here, there are four main work groups that have been devised. Um, a capacity work group that really focuses on just the workforce um, training as we're doing here today, thinking about all the things that go into just um, representation, uh, who is in our workforce, um, where are they located, uh, the training and licensing that goes into that, um, how do we make it more accessible? Uh, the contact for that is Bobby Peterson. Uh, there's a data work group that talks about the data that's available for all of us to help better understand just the, the, um, the context, what's, who's out there and, and what do we know about the landscape in our state around coverage. Uh, there's an outreach and education work group uh, or I'll go back to the data. So that's Melissa Duffy is the contact there. Uh, outreach and education uh, is led by Courtney Harris, um, whose contact information is there. Um, this is, as you might imagine, focused on um, what kind of outreach is happening, um, better understanding what is happening, um, how can maybe we be more collaborative um, and just better uh, provide education to a whole host of uh, professionals out there, whether they are directly involved in outreach or excuse me, uh, health coverage, or really just simply would be helpful for them to be aware of the um, resources and options that are available to their members. And then marketing promotions. Um, Kelsey McDermott uh, is listed as a contact there. And um, just a, as you can see, this is around how do we have coordinated messaging and um, but I do want to you know, make the point that these are both active work groups, but again, also looking at what are some recommendations that, um, that stakeholders that you are all seeing on the ground, how can we, how can we share this with the state and be more um, collaborative with the state to strengthen the overall networks and, and um, activities that are happening and um, how do we strengthen this this system that we have of helping uh, consumers make it into coverage. So we can share this uh, slide for sure on our website, our conference webpage. Um, we can send it out via one of the emails and follow up to the sessions. But again, I just wanted to make sure that was clear um, that this is open to all of you. And um, that's what makes it strong is participation and just having a voice. So uh, we encourage that. Um, so I will stop sharing my screen on that one. And um, looking at my list, oh, I did realize, I think I did this last year as well. I forgot uh, our first day's um, gift card uh, winner. So I will announce that now. And then later today, I'm really try to remember, uh, I'll announce the second day's winner. So the first day's winner, and apologies if I get this name wrong, Hillary Bieleflet. Um, I'm, I'm sure I got that wrong. Um, so congratulations on that uh, $50 gift card winner uh, for yesterday. All right, well, I know we have a few more minutes. Um, I am looking at our attendees, I think, we may be waiting on just one more um, for our next panel, and we have a few minutes. Um, I think we're just going to take a five minute break um, so that we start on time and that we make sure everybody is, is uh, ready. So um, Mike, why don't you go ahead and just put on the slides and we'll come back exactly at 9.15. All right. I know we have a couple more minutes. I'm gonna go ahead and address a couple of the Q&A questions just on admin items. And then I'll introduce our first, our moderator of our first session this morning. Um, so a couple of questions about slides. Um, yes, we, we do uh, aim to put slides up for sessions in the morning. Um, may not always be fully possible, but do check the conference webpage um, for today's sessions, and you will find um, slides there. Um, Mike, you can chime in and let me know if that's incorrect for today just yet, but um, I think in general, that's what we do aim to do each morning. So you have those, those of you that appreciate having those in front of you as you go through the sessions. 
And then there was another question about submitting photos. Yes, that was part of the registration process. We do try to include that as part of the registration process. Sorry if you missed that. Um, we always love to see photos. So if you wanted to submit that uh, for next week, we'll try to include it um, uh, as part of that slide presentation. And um, so, okay, so let me go ahead and introduce Tara Straw. So Tara is today's moderator for this session. So Tara, um, some of you may be well familiar with her. Um, she is the Director of Health Insurance and Marketplace Policy for the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, or CBPP. She primarily focuses on tax-related health issues, including the Affordable Care Act's premium tax credit, employer-sponsored health coverage, and health reimbursement arrangements. Um, she leads the Centers Beyond the Basics Project to train enrollment assisters on health uh, insurance, marketplace operations, and enrollment policies. Um, and that is an excellent series. I do encourage you all to, if you're not um, on the listserv, to get information from CBPP about that Beyond the Bas Basics series. Um, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, when Tara, you get on, you can um, let me know if I believe there are some, some webinars already happening or will be happening soon, like this week, um, that can uh, any of you can uh, watch to continue to uh, get yourself up to speed for this year's uh, open enrollment. Uh, Tara received a master's degree in public policy from American University and a law degree in LLM in taxation from Georgetown University Law Center. So with that, I will turn it over to Tara. Thank you. Thanks so much, Allison. And yes, we do have uh, webinars ongoing, training a training series. Um, and those are held on Tuesdays and Thursdays. We have them recorded and put on YouTube, which is a scary proposition sometimes. Um, but they are, they are available to anyone. And definitely, especially for new assisters, uh, they can be a pretty good guide to help you um, get on track for the enrollment season. So thanks so much for inviting me to, um, to be here. Uh, this is a really unique opportunity for you to hear about uh, most of the plans that you're going to find at healthcare.gov for Wisconsin. You're going to hear from, its, from uh, the people who are responsible for putting those plans up there. Um, so first, we're going to have a short presentation from each plan executive, and then we'll do a brief round table, but we'll leave plenty of time to get to questions uh, from the Q&A, I think from the Q&A um, box. Uh, so definitely type your questions in there and um, we'll get to them. We'll make sure we get to them. Okay, so with that, let's get started. Our first presentation is going to be from, from Erin Long. She's the Director of Health Plan Products at Security Health Plan. She's been working in the healthcare industry for 14 years with a primary focus on digital experience redesign initiatives, member engagement solutions, and health insurance product development. Erin oversees securities product development and implementation teams with the goal of driving innovation and growth while adhering to the mission, values, and uh, vision of Security Health Plan and the Marshfield uh, clinic health system. So with that, Erin, would you like to get us started? Sure. Thanks, Tara. Hope you can all hear me. So if you cannot, please let me know. I just wanted to thank you all for the opportunity to sit on the Qualified Health Plan Executive Panel this morning. As Tara said, my name is Erin Long, and I'm the Director of product, Health Plan Products at Security Health Plan. Security really strives to meet our mission, vision, and values in the communities we serve by ensuring access to affordable and high quality health insurance. Security Health Plan serves as an integrated care delivery system with the Marshall Clinic Health System. The Marshall Clinic Health System serves 40 communities across the North, West, and Central regions of our state. That includes nine hospitals, including the area's only children's hospital, along with 60 clinic locations. We are very proud and fortunate to be a part of this integrated system that puts patients and members first. Oops, and I'm sorry, I should have said advance the slide, please. 
There we go. Thank you. We can go to the next slide. Our mission, vision, and values shine through our individual and family plan offerings. In a sneak peek of what's coming for 2022, the individuals that you all help enroll in the marketplace with security will enjoy average double-digit decreases in premiums of around 12.2% on their plans. Individuals who choose Security Health Plan also gain access to value add perks. This would include 100% coverage for Care My Way, which is a video or phone service that they can seek care from, as well as a $30 quarterly over the counter credit that they can use to buy over the counter things that they use on a regular basis, like toothpaste and band aids, um, at no charge to them. We also offer even more exclusive perks on our Simply One and Enrich plans. Which speaking of Enrich, we are offering a brand new plan in Dodge County only called Enrich with access to the Marshall Clinic Health System, including the Beaver Dam Hospital, UW Health, and Unity Point Meritor locations. And finally, members on security plans will have access to select mental health prescriptions, at no cost, a $25 monthly cap on select insulins, and 100% coverage for select diabetic supplies. Next slide, please. Security is proud to serve individuals and families on and off the marketplace. And if you're curious to learn more about what security has to offer for your clients, I encourage you to reach out to our consumer sales team their email and phone number is on the slide. Um, you can learn about our plan offerings, what our coverage all entails, and all of the value add perks that come with our plans. So thank you for um, the time to be on the QHP panel today. I look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Erin. All right, up next, we have Brian Maddy. He's been the plan president of Molina Healthcare of Wisconsin since May of 2021. He brings decades of healthcare leadership and a dedicated focus on meeting provider needs that connect underserved populations to quality healthcare. Prior to joining Molina, uh, Brian was at the University of Oklahoma, uh, OU Health, Oklahoma's leading academic health system and was CEO for OU Physicians, a provider organization aligned with OU Health. So Brian, take it away. Good morning. I too uh, am thrilled to be able to participate in, in, in this discussion today. So uh, if we could uh, go to the first slide, I did, don't have our mission and vision on here, but uh, again, Molina is a, a plan that uh, is an innovative national healthcare company that provides quality programs and services for vulnerable and government programs. So. Uh, it's exciting to, to be here with everyone. For us for this year, uh, we're adding a new silver plan that's going to replace our bronze plans. We believe it gives us more value for the customers than what we had with the old bronze plans. Uh, we're offering a new wellness program called My Health Perks that includes incentives for targeted health activities, including getting a, a health assessment. Uh, we will have a free teledoc uh, as a virtual visit uh, option for our members. And then we have several low and no deductible plans. Our select silver plans will offer a $0 copay for our tier one or our generic drugs. We go to the next slide, please. Um, we have within side of uh, our, our health plan, some of Wisconsin's largest healthcare systems, uh, obviously Ascension, Aurora, Children's of Wisconsin, Door County Memorial, uh, Holy Family Memorial, and Freighter South down in, in Kenosha. Uh, our provider network has increased in Southeastern Wisconsin with the opening of three new Ascension hospitals. Uh, we have a new provider directory that's online that makes it easier to locate those in-network providers as well. Next slide, please. 
should show a map as well of the 29 counties that we serve. And you can see it's uh, south, it's eastern and southeastern uh, Wisconsin. And next slide, please. I think the one thing I wanted to give the opportunity for everyone participating in today's uh, meeting is that we do have uh, sessions for enrollment assisters, and you can see the dates when those are. They're about a month away, October 13th, 19th, and 28th. I uh, encourage everyone to participate in those and, and learn more about some of the offerings that we have for this next year. I'm happy to answer questions when it's appropriate as well. Thank you all. Thank you. I um, just want to remind everyone, if you have questions, you can put them in the Q&A uh, feature. And um, that's going to be the fastest way to get your questions answered versus raising your hand. Um, so uh, please use the Q&A feature because we're excited to hear your questions. All right, next up, uh, we've got Kathy Mahaffey uh, is the CEO of Common Ground Healthcare uh, Cooperative. She is a 29 year veteran of the health insurance industry with a passion for working in the nonprofit cooperative health insurance sector. Kathy began her involvement in Common Ground Health Cooperative at the early stages and helped pen the business plan uh, and loan application that secured the funding to start the cooperative. And Kathy was appointed CEO of the cooperative in 2014. So Kathy, please go. Thank you so much um, for having me. I always enjoy this panel and um, we really, really appreciate the work that you all do. We know that you're out there, boots on the ground, helping people. I always say health insurance is unnecessarily com complex. And so we really appreciate um, all the work that you do and, and we're just here really to, to support you. So you can go ahead to the next slide, Michael. Um, so a little bit about us. Um, many of you know that we have been in the um, ACA marketplace since the very beginning, since 2014. You know, our mission is really to put members first and pursue better health care on their behalf. We're organized as a cooperative, which means when enrollees buy health insurance from us, they actually become a member of our cooperative. And that's who we exist to serve. Um, we don't have any other owners or um, um, any other um, folks to focus on other than our, our members. In fact, our board of directors are elected from our membership and their members too. So we really are able to integrate the voice of the members in all that we do at our cooperative. And we're nonprofit, which just means that, you know, what we do is uh, we look for opportunities to return um, our earnings back to our members. Um, and you'll notice that we've done that once again in terms of lowering health insurance premiums. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just uh, a little bit about us too, um, you know, with that theme of putting members first, you know, we, we do survey our members so that we are really um, sure that we're providing the level of service that they deserve. Um, so we're really pleased that our net promoter score uh, continues to increase, um, really, again, providing that evidence that um, you know, we're serving our members. Um, you know, a lot of our members have, uh, you know, very uh, concerning situations and we know it's just our responsibility to be there and help them navigate through the, all the complexities. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so our um, rate changes, right? We, as I said, we're reducing rate, uh, rates again, uh, fourth year in the row. Um, uh, so um, again, hoping to help people with uh, lowering costs. Um, and also in 2022, we will no longer have a premium surcharge for tobacco users. We heard from you. Um, you all told us that this was, you know, um, an issue for some members um, experiencing that surcharge. So we took a hard look at that and we made that decision for next year no, to no longer have a surcharge. So we know that will benefit uh, many of our members as well as other um, consumers out there who, uh, who are looking for a plan that, that don't have a surcharge. Next slide, please. So um, this is our service area. Um, so we are adding three counties in 2022, Jefferson, Dodge, um, and Walworth. Next slide, please. Um, along with that uh, is a addition of a provider. So we're adding Water Watertown Regional Medical Center in 2022, and that will help us serve Dodge and Jefferson counties. Next slide. 
We also think it's important for you to know as you're out there helping uh, people that um, the St. Joe's um, campus is no longer going to be part of our network. They let us know that um, uh, that because we had just the St. Joe's facility, that that was difficult to administer. We certainly understand that. So just wanting to make sure as you're out there um, talking with, with people that, that you understand that that is um, a change in our network, that they'll no longer be part of our network at the end of this year. We're also communicating with our members too, so that they're aware of that. And we can help them find a, a new in-network provider as, as a result. All right, next slide, please. So this is really just a visual of all the providers that we have contracts with. Of course, we have many, many more, many independents, but these are our main provider partners um, that we really have had a great working relationship um, over the years. And, and of course, look forward to the one with Watertown Memorial uh, or Medical Center as well. Next slide, please. So a few things that I know you wanna know about, um, what are the changes? What are you uh, looking forward to uh, in, in 2022? Um, I think you hear this from a number of us, zero dollar deductible plans. We, we heard, again, we listened. Consumers are really interested in those types of plan designs. So we'll have those available. We're also adding um, vision um, so that we can cover a routine vision exam. As you know, that's not an essential health benefit. So we're adding that to some of our, our plans if that's an option. Uh, people want to um, buy. And then dental will be a new offering for us in certain rating areas, rating areas one, nine, and 12. Um, we'll be adding um, an option for folks to buy um, dental coverage. Next slide, please. Um, we also have Virtuel. I think that this is, um, you know, we're, uh, we've had the Virtuel for some time, but I think with COVID, a lot of us are talking about the telehealth services that are, that are going to be available to members as a result. Uh, next slide, please. And the dental, just a little bit more detail. Forward Dental will be our, our dental provider um, as we add that benefit. And next slide. Great. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Um, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so next we have Angela McKeon, she began her career at Quartz in 2011. As director of Marketplace Product, she has responsibility for product development, implementation, and performance of Quartz's individual and family plans. Under her leadership, Quartz has successfully launched Marketplace Products in three states, including federal and state-based marketplaces, and has experienced membership growth through product enhancements and geographic expansions. All right, take it away, Angela. Thanks, Tara, and good morning, everyone. I wanna spend a few minutes today discussing the ongoing impacts of COVID-19, then dive into changes that we have planned for the 2022 benefit year from the perspective of benefits, service area and networks, but also how we're servicing and communicating with our members in a whole new way. Before I get started, I need to satisfy the lawyers. And so a quick disclaimer that Quartz is expecting the final approval of our QHP application for certification in 2022, and that will come on October 5th. We can go ahead to the next slide. So COVID-19 has truly brought the good, the bad, and the ugly. And it's obvious what the bad and ugly are, but there are definitely some good that has come from the last 18 plus months. First and foremost, Quartz remains committed to our members and the communities we serve. We launched Quartz Cares at the beginning of the pandemic and were able to reach out to over 5,000 of our highest risk members to provide information on resources available to them to stay safe and well during the lockdown. We also initiated giving campaigns for employees to pledge with Quartz matching the donation to local and national nonprofit organizations to support the great work they do in our communities. But we didn't stop there. The Quartz Cares campaign and program and efforts continue to support the health and well being of our members and our communities. Additionally, over the last 12 months, we've witnessed overall medical service utilization return to pre pandemic levels. As doctors work to balance elective procedures with COVID care, there has also been a very quick transition of care delivery to health, telehealth and virtual care. Consumers want access to care when and where they need it. They want convenience and they want it to be easy. Next slide, please. And the world may never be the same post COVID. And as I mentioned, I think that's okay on some levels. Quartz has evaluated the changing utilization and markets to develop our plans for 2022. And we have some really exciting news to share with you. 
Next slide. For benefit year 2022, Quartz is expanding our footprint for individual on and off exchange plans by adding 18 new counties to our service area. During the upcoming open enrollment period, residents in 15 counties in eastern Wisconsin, spanning from Kenosha to Marinette, including Milwaukee County, as well as three counties in western Wisconsin, being Chippewa, Eau Claire, and Pepin, can enroll in a Quartz individual plan to be effective January 1st, 2022. We're pleased to offer our Quartz One network in these areas and continue to deliver on our promise of guaranteed access to high quality providers, such as Aurora Healthcare, Gunderson Health System, and UW Health. Gunder Quartz will continue to cover five counties in southeastern Minnesota and seven counties in northwestern Illinois as well. Next slide. At Courts, we don't want to disrupt the momentum of virtual care. That's why we're adding a virtual first benefit to all of our non-HSA eligible or non-HDHP plan designs. This virtual first benefit sets member cost sharing at $0 on primary care, behavioral health therapy, and urgent care services performed via telehealth or virtual visit. Our new and improved Find a Doctor search tool will help consumers identify providers that offer these services, and Courts will not require members to have an in-person visit before seeking virtual care. Next slide. Transparency is the trend for 2022, and Quartz is excited to introduce a new tiered network to the market that provides members with the ability to better manage their healthcare costs. The Tiered Choice Plus network takes our full Quartz network and creates two tiers of providers. High quality providers with the lowest costs will be clearly identified as providers in tier one, and members will pay the least cost sharing when accessing care from these providers. Providers with the highest costs will be in tier two. Members will pay more out of pocket when seeking services from providers in this tier. Along with access to lower cost care, the network will come with a lower premium than we could offer on our traditional network. Members residing in the, shared county, the shaded counties on this map who are currently enrolled in a gold and some silver plans will be automatically renewed to a tiered choice plus network plan for 2022. And to help members navigate the tiered network and plan designs, they'll have exclusive access to one-on-one -on -one service and support through the courts champion, a dedicated team of experts providing personalized service and supports. Next slide. So Quartz Champion is a customer service model that combines both customer service and medical management. Supports our members in a more personalized approach. Each member will have a dedicated care team assigned to them and can interact with their Quartz Champion through their preferred method of communication, whether that's by phone call, email, or a face-to-face -face video chat, and they'll have the option to schedule at a time that's convenient for them. Courts Champion will service the member holistically, answering questions about benefits, helping them provide, find a provider or a facility, getting them access to the Courts member portal, and improving condition management and outcomes. Next slide. Again, thank you for joining, and thank you to Covering Wisconsin for inviting Courts to participate in this panel today. We're very excited about the year ahead and look forward to partnering with you to serve our members and our communities. Thank you. So much, Angela. All right, next up is Jeremy Ott. He's been with WPS since uh, 2002 and has been in his current role as Vice President of Health Insurance Economics since March 2016. In his current role, he oversees a cross-functional team that is focused on developing and implementing innovative strategies to lower the cost of healthcare and improve the member experience. Prior to his current role, Jeremy has held positions in underwriting and sales, giving him a more unique perspective on healthcare. All right, Jeremy, take it, Jeremy. Do you want to go on to the next and then we'll come back to Jeremy? Can you hear me now? Yes, Jeremy, we can uh, hear you. Sorry. Okay, sorry. Uh, that's always every presenter's worst uh, dream is having the technical issues and it's always the hardest part. So sorry, I logged off and he came back on. So. Uh, sorry for that slight uh, interruption there, but uh, for you that might not be familiar with WPS Health Plan, it is a fully owned subsidiary of Wisconsin Physicians and Service, Service Insurance Corporation, or better known as WPS. Our headquarters is located in Madison, Wisconsin, and we have secondary off operational offices in Green Bay. 
I wanted to let everybody know that all of our sales and service employees are located within the state of Wisconsin. So you are talking to fellow Wisconsin residents that understand the needs and the wants of Wisconsinites. WPS is, an independent, is independent, meaning that we are not owned or have any direct affiliation with a specific provider system. We are also not for profit, meaning we're not out to make profits for our shareholders or our owners. Being independent and not for profit allows us to focus on doing what is right for our members. This year, WPS is very excited to be celebrating our 75th year of caring for Wisconsin residents. Next slide, please. For 2022, our service area will remain the same as it was for 2021 for both WPS Health Plan and WPS Health Insurance. WPS Health Plan will offer on exchange products in 22 counties, mainly in Eastern Wisconsin. You'll see those highlighted in yellow on the map to your, on the right. For WPS Health Plan, we will continue to offer both HMO and point of service plan designs for members for 2022. Additionally, we do offer off exchange only plans through our parent company WPS in 23 counties, mainly located in Northwestern Wisconsin. All of our plan options for both WPS and WPS Health Plan include access to Teladoc at, at reduced or no cost to our members, and also includes vision discount programs available for any member that signs up. The most exciting part for 2022 is that all of our plans will see uh, improved lower prices for 2022. For WPS in Northwestern Wisconsin, we will see average decreases of about six to 7% in the majority of that service area. And for WPS Health Plan in Eastern Wisconsin, we will see premium decreases between four and 7% across the board uh, in the counties, in the regions that we are participating in for 2022. Uh, next slide. Uh, just a little bit of information for WPS Health Plan. All the people enrolled in our WPS Health Plan have access to our select network. And while the select network is only available in 22 counties, I did want to show the map on the right to show uh, the breadth of the network and how far it does expand. Our network does have in-network access in over 50 counties and includes 49 hospitals throughout the state of Wisconsin. That is the the part that's highlighted in orange there, and does include over 7,000 providers as part of our network. Uh, we, we believe our members having choice and access to a high quality network is essential uh, for all of our members. Some of the major provider systems that you'll see as part of our network include Aurora Healthcare, uh, Bellin, Children's, Gunderson Pro Health, Theta Care, and UW. So, I want to thank so much everybody for giving me the time to be here today and look forward to being part of the panel. Thank you, uh, Jeremy. You're um, more nimble with the technology than, than I am. So I think I would have just um, been typing in the chat asking for help. Uh, okay, so next we have up, um, last but certainly not least, uh, Mark Rakowski. He is the Chief Operating Officer of Children's Community Health Plan. He's been with the plan since 2006. And under his leadership, CCHP has grown to over 165,000 Medicaid and Marketplace members and is the second largest Medicaid health plan in the state. The plan is focused on improving the health and well-being of its members by providing access to a broad network of health services and providers, as well as prevention programs. Mark has previously held positions at Aurora Healthcare and Blue Cross and Blue Shield United of Wisconsin. So Mark, please take it away. Thank you, Tara. And thanks to uh, Covering Wisconsin for putting on this enrollment conference again this year. We're, we're very pleased to participate. You can go to the next slide. Children's Community Health Plan as a reminder, we're, we're a not-for-profit health plan owned by Children's Wisconsin. As Tara mentioned, we, we um, began in 2006 um, in the Badger Care Program or the Medicaid Program in Wisconsin. We have a, a foster care pilot called Care for Kids. And then in 2017, we began offering products on and off the exchange uh, under the program or under the product name together with CCHP. So we've, we've been um, offering 
these for the last five years. As you're about to hear, we're very pleased to let you know that in, 2000, in 2022, we will be offering standalone dental plans as well in um, select counties. So I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit. As Chair mentioned, we also, uh, also mentioned we have over 165,000 covered lives in the state um, focused on improving their health and, and the well being of those members. Next slide. Together with CCHP in 2022, we have no change to our service area. We're, we're in 14 counties, six counties in Southeast Wisconsin, eight counties in Northeast Wisconsin. We are very excited to be offering a new zero deductible uh, um, pl bronze plan in 2022. We, we heard loud and clear from our brokers, from our members, that this is something they were interested in. We're offering this both on and off the exchange. No changes to our network, at least no, no reduction to our network. We continue to have Freighter Medical College, all Ascension facilities, uh, Children's Wisconsin, in Northeast Wisconsin, Holy Family, Bell and Health, Door County, we've got Rogers Behavioral Health, the Independent Physicians Network, and new for 2022, Pro Healthcare is participating in our network. Pro Healthcare based in Waukesha, hospitals in the city of Waukesha, hospitals in, in Oconomowoc, um, available for all of our members and all of our products. So great news and, and great expansion to our network. Next slide. We continue to waive all out-of-pocket costs uh, for COVID-related testing and treatment. We all unfortunately know that it, that is continuing in our communities. And I think really unique for us is, is that waiver is not just for individuals who test positive for COVID, it's, it's, it's for any testing that could be COVID related. So even um, those tests that come back negative, that, that might just be respiratory issues, out-of-pocket costs are waived. We have no member balance billing for out-of-area emergency care, whether that's in the state of Wisconsin, whether that's um, anywhere in the country, balance billing is not something that our members will be experiencing. And we continue to offer wellness incentives, um, gift cards based on um, preventive care, completion of health needs assessments, and registration for our member portal and other programs that we offer to our members. Next slide. I mentioned we're, we're starting to offer now standalone dental coverage, both on and off the exchange. This is a comprehensive dental policy. Preventive care and basic and major services are all covered. Um, this is for adults, for children. It's available in six counties in Southeast Wisconsin. Kenosha, Milwaukee, Ozaki, Racine, Washington, and Waukesha counties. And we have two different plan options. We, we have a premier coverage with less out-of-pocket and standard coverage as well. So whatever um, a family is looking for, we will be able to offer. Next slide. This is a, a list of some of the members and programs that, that we are, member programs and benefits that we offer. We are certainly focused on, on digital health um, and digital solutions beyond telehealth. We offer apps that are at no cost to our members um, to manage uh, orthopedic issues, back pain, knee pain, um, neck pain. We have an app for members with suffering from panic attacks and, and anxiety. We've got an incentive program for our members with diabetes. Beyond the, the zero dollar insulin medications, we have an app called Blue Star that can help them manage their diet and manage their health um, if they've got type two diabetes. Programs for pregnant women, as well as case management programs for members with asthma, diabetes, and depression. In 2021, we offer a treat, began offering a treatment cost calculator so our members can get upfront estimates of the cost for any service provided in our network. And a triage line as well. No cost nurse triage services available 24 seven. New in, in 2021 is a program called Food Smart. Um, this is a telenutrition program. All of our members at no cost can get access to um, registered dietitians to develop meal plans to help them with culturally appropriate um, 
recipes and, and then help them save money when they're shopping. This allows them to shop online, or order groceries um, right online if they choose to, either for delivery or for pickup. Um, their meal plans are, are built, built right into that application to find them the lowest cost groceries available in, in their community. Really excited for that. It was just kicked off this year. Next slide. Any questions, obviously, I will, 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 you can ask during the, the um, Q&A session that we have coming up, or, or you can contact us directly at our broker support email um, or at customer service for our, any of our members. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Mark. And thank, thank all of you for, um, for those presentations. Um, next, we're gonna uh, look at one of our poll questions and quiz you a little bit on, on how much you learned, uh, you've learned so far. So um, uh, Mike, do you wanna thank you? So plan, uh, poll, a panel poll question number one, do you know which health plans serve consumers in your area? So we're gonna give you a few minutes to answer that question, or we'll say one minute. So what are our results? So right. just, to, oh, sorry, Mike, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, it looks like we're about 42% for our uh, yes to all of them and about 56% for mostly. That's great. Um, and hopefully uh, you've learned a little bit more um, from our presenters today um, to bring up those um, mostly in yes numbers. All right. So next we're gonna go on to just a little brief round table before we get to your questions. Again, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, we're gonna leave time to do that. Uh, so first, um, some of you, you know, sort of referenced some of this, but um, the Biden administration created a six month special enrollment period in 2021 and the health provisions of the American Rescue Plan cut premiums across the board for 2021 and 2022. The enhanced premium tax credit allows people with income below 150% of the federal poverty line or about $19,000 a year for a single person to get a $0 premium benchmark silver plan. Uh, the law also expands eligibility to people with income over 400% FPL. So big questions, big picture, um, did you see increased enrollment during the SEP? Um, and do you anticipate further growth in 2022 as a result of the new premium uh, discounts? And you know, if you could give us an idea of where you expect that growth. So is it mostly lower income people where I think the, um, who I think mostly came into the SCP in 2021, or do you anticipate moving into those higher market markets with people who have income over 400% of poverty? And how do you wanna get the word out on these new discounts that could bring more people in? Um, Kathy, do you wanna get us started? Sure, thank you. Uh, so great questions. Um, you know, we definitely experienced growth during the special enrollment period. Um, so it was nice to see that people were actually out there taking a look um, again at the Affordable Care Act and, and in actively enrolling. Um, also, in addition to that, you know, um, typically in, in, in this, um, uh, in the ACA, you see members exit each month, um, you know, for various reasons. And so we really didn't see the member attrition either this year. So I think those are really great indicators that more people are, are getting insured and then they're staying insured, which is what we want. Um, we do anticipate further growth in 2022. And I think, you know, uh, two areas that we might, might see that is, you know, we've, um, it's been reported, right, that people between 100 and 150 percent of the federal poverty level have been exiting um, coverage over the last couple of years. 
And so we see that as a real opportunity for growth. You know, now that um, people can qualify for that zero dollar premium plan that you mentioned. So we really see that as a, as a growth opportunity, um, you know, in, in Wisconsin. And then also for consumers over 400% of the federal poverty level, as, as you mentioned, they can now qualify for some premium assistance. I think it's a matter of, of just getting the word out to them so that they're aware of that and can take advantage of it. So I think those two populations, and then of course, you know, with the um, redeterminations in Medicaid, that also just gives us an available, you know, group of people to help and make sure that they stay um, insured. Um, you know, getting the word out is probably the toughest thing that, that all of us collectively do, right, year over year over year. Uh, one of our biggest opportunities, but challenges as well. So we do a number of things with communications, both to our existing members, but also to consumers um, in general. You know, we're very involved in the DHS OCI partnership and really trying to contribute there in terms of what can we do in Wisconsin to, to increase awareness. You know, we have great relationships with brokers and agents and, and you all uh, boots on the ground, but getting the word out is, is the most important thing we can do. And I think that, you know, trying to have that call to action too, to be like, you know, people may have looked last year and the year before and the year before, but, but there's something new here and getting people to act, I think is, is, um, is what we need. So thank you. Thanks so much, Kathy. Um, Mark, do you wanna speak to this? Sure, uh, thank you. S similar to, to Kathy's experience in Common Ground, we've also seen uh, experience increased enrollment this year. In fact, compared to 2019, it's about a fourfold increase. So as, as we look at the, the number of new members each month, it's about four times as many this year as two years ago and, and almost double what we experienced last year. Um, so it has clearly made a difference. We're seeing growth in, in the low income end and in the higher income end. I think, as Kathy mentioned, it's really important that cliff at 400% of the poverty level is, is now maybe turned into a ramp. Um, it, it's certainly not eliminated completely, but, it, but it's now an opportunity for some of those higher income individuals to, to get more support. And we worked really hard to get the word out to our members this year, um, both directly to our members and also to our brokers and agents. We wanted to make sure that members updated their information on, on healthcare.gov. So if, if they were eligible for increased support, they, they would get that as soon as possible. And then working with the brokers to let them know what happens when members switch plans, when they either go from off exchange to, to potentially on exchange now, um, or when they switch metal levels, um, how their deductible is impacted. And, and good news for us, we, we carried those deductibles forward so they, they didn't have to start them over again. Um, so that was really important to us. We, we work very closely with brokers and agents and um, we know for probably half of our members, um, that that's where they turn to when they have questions. So um, we wanna make sure they have the answers. Great, thank you. Um, Jeremy, do you want to weigh in on this one? This one? Yeah, thank you. Uh, very similar to, to Kathy and Mark. I think a lot of us experienced the same thing. So we definitely saw significant growth uh, on the individual through this. Uh, it's a little bit hard to tell exactly how much of it was attributed to, to this, but when you see the, the amount or the, the exponential growth that you saw, you know that, that a big portion of that was due to the act that was passed and, and the benefits of it. Um, in my role at WPS, I have a little bit more of a holistic view of outside, not just the individual plans, but, but all the lines of business at WPS. And, and one of the things to maybe address, do we continue to see this as, as a growth opportunity in this market? I think too often we look at it as just the individual market by itself, uh, where I'm looking at it both from not only what impacts are there in the individual market, but also changes are there going to be in the employer space. Uh, that may impact and, and have more people be eligible or looking for individual coverage. And as we've started to see some of the pent up demand from the initial COVID-19 come off and we've seen claims experience for employers be higher uh, in the past year than it maybe had been, I think a lot of it will have to do with what kind of increases carriers are giving to employers in 2022 that may impact their decisions to either continue to offer coverage or stop offering coverage or change benefits significantly to, to offset some of those costs. So those are all types of things that we're monitoring from the WPS perspective to, to keep an eye on the holistic view that may 
have some impact on the individual markets as we look at, at 2022 and make sure that we're able to, to work with those individuals that may be impacted by some of those changes in the employer market as well. That's really interesting, thank you. Erin, um, do you wanna take this? Sure, thank you. Um, well, I would certainly echo um, a lot of the comments that the other panelists have made. I just wanna say that, you know, as we um, have experienced growth with the SEP and the increased subsidies and tax credits that individuals on the marketplace are getting, it's really important to re-educate these individuals on the type of plan that's going to work best for them. Historically, some of these individuals have resorted to enrolling in a bronze plan simply because it's the lowest premium. But now with the increased tax credits available, maybe it makes sense to move into a silver plan and now they're eligible for the cost sharing reductions that will not only also provide some premium relief, but also some additional out-of-pocket cost relief. And so um, I think a lot of that education is important to, you know, uh, reiterate this year. And, um, you know, it's kind of a combination of everything, not just the plan designs, not just the increased tax credits, but there are so many great provider networks associated with all of the different plan options available on the marketplace as well. But, where do your consumers doctor, where does it make most sense for them to turn to when they're in need of health care? So it's more of that holistic view. It's not just premium. It's not just plan. It's also the provider network. And the combination of all of those is um, really going to help our consumers make the best decision for them this upcoming open enrollment season. Um, and hopefully we can move some of those individuals that have previously resorted to a bronze plan into a silver or a gold plan because um, it makes sense to do so for their pocketbooks as well. So thank you. Thanks, Erin. That's a really important point and one that um, a sister should keep in mind this year that people who come in and have enrolled in, in bronze plans previously might now realize that silver plans are really affordable and, and also qualify for uh, CSRs. Um, thanks everyone. Um, next question. There has been an increased focus on racial and economic equity um, in the health system. Uh, so looking at disparities in who has coverage, who gets care, quality of that care, health, health outcomes, the whole um, A to Z of health insurance. So what's your company doing to improve access and outcomes for traditionally underserved populations? Um, Jeremy, do you wanna start us on this one? Yeah, great. Thank you. And, and this is a very big topic and probably worth its own panel discussion to spend an hour or two on, on this topic as, a, as well by itself. But I'll just kind of hit on it at, at a high level because this has been a very important issue for WPS that we've been trying to get out in front of for the last handful of years. This isn't something new that, that has just come up in, in our mind, um, but, but it continues to be an issue. And maybe at first I'm going to start by identifying one of the key challenges that I think everybody as part of this, this call could be could help with. And because one of the most difficult parts of dealing with health equity um, is collecting the, the pieces of information that insurers need in order to be able to, to assist the members and, and to collect the data. And this isn't just a, a challenge in Wisconsin, but this is a challenge across our nation. And you know, the, the good part is on the individual side, we typically get more information than we might on our other commercial um, populations because of the application process and some of that information shared back with us. But that information is only as good as, as you know, the, the quality it is that the, the individuals filling out the application uh, put in it. And it is, it can provide some very important pieces of information. Um, so one of the big things would be if, if you can encourage and then pass the application when you're engaging with your insurance company, if you can share with the people you're working with how important it is to make sure that they're giving accurate and updated you know, information to share with them and not be afraid to share that information with your health insurance carrier because they, a lot of us have programs in place that are, that are meant to help and assist them. And, and for some reason, uh, there seems to be a little bit of disconnect with the members and, and we need to be able to break that down and to help. So I think that's a big part if we can get past that and, and just start to collect some of the information, I think it's gonna make a lot of things I'm about to talk about now about some of the things that we're doing at WPS and have been doing at WPS to address specifically around that outcomes. Um, over the last couple of years, we've invested very heavily in developing and, and implementing new programs to, to help all of our members, but really kind of targeted at some of these underserved populations. And, and some of these programs include things like 
uh, investing in data analytics to identify gaps in care for members and reaching out to those members to, to assist them in getting the care they need. And it's amazing to see how some members are are surprised when a health insurance company is reaching out to them and, and recommending that they go out and get the care. And I think all of us here would, would say that our goal is for people to get the appropriate, the care that they need as part of that. And then on top of that, we build up programs. Then once you've helped them to tell them the types of care they need, following up on, on appointment adherence, uh, a medication adherence, making sure that if they are on a medication and make sure that they're, they're taking that medications. Obviously, vaccines are a big topic right now, not only COVID, but all vaccines and making sure that people are up to date on those types of things and reaching out to them and working with them to identify places that they can go and get the vaccines as needed. And, and one of the biggest initiatives we have, which seems simple, um, but it's, it's uh, keeping ourselves up to date on available community resources and support. There's so many things out in the community that people are doing that are resources that people just don't know about. So how can we, as, as the insurance company, be seen as a trusted resource to help connect the individual members that we have with those resources that are there to help? And I, I think those are, are some of the key things we're trying to do. Um, and if I can really quickly, just one example of, of a pilot we did, uh, and as I'm sure a lot of my colleagues did this as well, is when COVID-19 hit, um, we immediately got out in front of it and, and did our best to identify anybody that we would have identified as, as a potential high risk uh, individual as part of that, uh, either made based on their medical conditions or thing like uh, different types of things like that. And we did have tremendous success. Uh, this was probably one of the highest engagement activities that, that we've had. Maybe it was a, just a coincidence and more people were home, you know, working from home and so they could take calls. It was easier to connect with them, but people were really engaged. And we were just really trying to drive awareness of the public health guidance for COVID ensure members had access to their medications because some people weren't leaving their houses and didn't want to go to the pharmacy to pick up their prescriptions. So what could we do to help? Um, you know, and really make sure that we're promoting uh, health care, whether it's if they don't feel comfortable going to their primary care, can we set you up for teledoc? Can we have a virtual visit? Those types of things. And, and we had tremendous uh, success with that. And it's it's been great. And it's a big focus at WPS. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. But uh, it, hopefully it gets you insight into some of the things that we're doing. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, Mark, do you have anything to add to this that you're working on? Uh, yeah, I do, Tara. Thank you. I, I think, you know, beyond the health care that we all provide to our members and that we arrange for them, the, the biggest drivers of these inequities are around social issues and, and other non-medically related drivers of health. And that's an area that, that um, we are acutely focused on how do we support our members um, beyond the, the doctors and hospitals in our network. Um, we know that our lower income members in particular may have challenges with transportation. And, and so if they've missed appointments, um, we can cover transportation costs to and from doctor's appointments for them. Um, members who are discharged from the hospital are, may often have a hard time with nutrition. And so we, we've covered meals. Um, for them as they've gotten back into their home and, and are, are recuperating from whatever um, conditions that, that cause them to get hospitalized. We, we look at those, we, we look at the, the telehealth, as, as Jeremy mentioned, it, it's the digital solutions. I, I think behavioral health has been a huge area that maybe that's a silver lining of, of the pandemic, that members are much more comfortable um, accessing virtual care for behavioral health conditions. And I think we're getting more and more members into treatment now who may have been reluctant or, or unable to, to find the time on their um, calendar to get into a, a, an appointment in an office. They can do it in the comfort of their own home now. So I think that's been a real benefit, um, that, that awareness and that comfort of, of virtual options. Texting members um, more and more. I, I think that's a way to get engagement of members um, both by health plans and by providers. Um, providers are doing that more and more and um, making sure that appointments don't get missed by, by those text reminders. So I, I think we're all looking for creative solutions um, for our entire population, but in particular, some of those, those lower income members that we all serve, um, how do we get them more engaged with their health care? Partnering with community organizations is also something that we're really focused on. 
Um, especially now around COVID vaccines. We're, we're partnering with an organization called Healthy Connections. We're doing mobile vaccine clinics, partnering with federally qualified health centers in, in the community, making it more convenient for members to get the COVID vac vaccinations. They trust those community organizations. They trust them, unfortunately, more than they trust health plans. And so that partnership, I, I think, really enables us to, to make a, a, an impact around a lot of those social drivers. Excellent. Um, Brian, is there anything that you want to add to this? And we covered a lot of it, but uh, maybe to hit it a little bit on what Mark said and emphasize Jeremy's part two. And I think we all know and appreciate the fact that the health of our members, the health of, of the community, uh, the studies have shown that 80% of it's outside of what goes on in a provider's office. And we know it's those social areas, proper nutrition, uh, transportation, housing. And you know, I think again, with some of the things that Melina has been able to do of being that provider or payer for uh, um, government programs, a large Medicaid population, We've built lots of services through our uh, community engagement team that we're out in the community uh, partnering with different organizations to find what are those services that we can work with the providers and then wrap those services around the patient as well or the member as well. My old days of, of being the old provider still coming out on me. But I think the bigger part too that we all probably have is that you've got to have some form of, of systematic way that you're evaluating the approach that you're taking to make sure that you're being culturally competent in the services and care that you're providing. You need to make sure that, you know, again, use the term that we all hear anymore, the algorithms, to be able to properly assign a member uh, to a provider that is culturally, racially, ethnically, linguistically meeting the needs of that patient. The last thing you want to do is to marry up a provider with one of our members and there's not a connection because again, you've got to make sure that we're providing that level of service to, to our members. Um, but we do this and we do an ongoing analysis. We we, we uh, evaluate our abilities on an annual basis as a system in terms of what are the quality measures that we should be looking at, what are the interventions and the activities that we can design to help our members uh, to really address some of those cultural and, and diversity issues that exist there. So uh, I, think, I think that's kind of where we are. Thanks so much, Brian. Um, okay, so we have um, one last question, and it's one that could get its get a, its own conference, let alone its own panel, let alone its own question. And I'm going to make it that much harder, and I'm going to call this a lightning round because I want to make sure that we get to the um, to the audience questions. Um, at the same time, this is a really important one, and so I don't want to ignore it. Um, during the pandemic, people eligible for Medicaid have been protected from disenrollment by a provision that's tied to the public health emergency. So essentially, once they're in, they've been able to stay in. Um, it's unclear when this policy is going to end, likely sometime in 2022. Uh, but when it does, many current Medicaid beneficiaries could lose coverage, either due to no longer meeting eligibility requirements or um, for administrative reasons like return mail or not submitting income documents um, when asked. So can you tell me a little bit more about, and we'll start with Angela on this one, about what your company is planning um, to, reach this, uh, to reach this population that loses Medicaid and could become uninsured? Yeah, I think there's really right two populations that we are targeting. Those who are going to lose Medicaid and are actually still eligible for Medicaid, but they haven't taken the action that they need to from an administrative perspective. And those who are losing Medicaid because their situation has now changed and they're no longer eligible. 
Um, in both instances, in absence of an envelope that, you know, is delivered to their house and explodes with confetti that comes out of it to, you know, encourage them to read the communications, um, we're really trying to identify the best avenue for communicating. And so is it email? Is it personal letters? Is it phone calls and outreach? Um, directing them to the website for more information. Um, we really want to make sure that we are helping those members retain the plan or move into the plan that is most appropriate for them. As Aaron mentioned before, you know, part of it is just the premium perspective for them. But the other part is, are you in a plan that makes sense that you're going to be able to afford to actually get your care? Um, you know, what's great about Wisconsin, it's a really competitive market. And yes, we're all competitors. But at the end of the day, I think we're all in health insurance because we want to do what's right for the member. And so making sure that we can get ahead of that happening um, the tricky part now is, is we don't know what that date is, but I can tell you from a court's perspective, we've been really happy to see we have members that call us and say, I'm currently on Medicaid. I know that I'm not going to be eligible. Can I get an individual plan now? And so having to have that conversation without a date in which it's, <laughs> this is this is the date in which you will be able to switch so that you don't have to um, potentially pay back APTCs that you're ineligible for, et cetera that's a really tricky conversation to have right now. So we just wanna make sure that we're keeping that communication open and continuing to have that conversation informing members all the way up until the date in which we know that this is going to happen. Thank you, Angela. Um, Mark, do you have something um, quick to say about that? Just to add as a Medicaid plan that, that's also in, in a qualified health plan, we have the benefit of being able to provide information to those Badger Care members about the offerings we have if they lose their Medicaid eligibility. And so, you know, working with them up front to make sure they can remain in Medicaid if that's where, where they're eligible, and then providing them with resources, how to sign up, how to enroll in a qualified plan if they lose that Medicaid eligibility. It's one of the reasons that, that we decided to get into the marketplace is to have that, that continuity across both lines of business. Thank you, Mark. Um, Brian, do you have anything to add to what they've said? Well, I like the confetti idea, so I'm gonna steal that one for sure. Uh, but some, a couple of other things that we do, to, to Mark's point again, being a, a Medicaid payer as well, I mean, we have an ability to identify our members that are going to go off and to work with them to transition them into a, into a marketplace plan. Uh, we're also gonna, you know, again, we're gonna reach out to the members and we have an organization called Care Connections where we have nurse practitioners that are seeing the patients and the members in the home and we'll make sure that we help on those transitions during that period of time as well. Thanks so much, Brian. Erin, do you wanna speak to this? Sure, thanks. Um, I echo what many of the other panelists have said. I think um, one of the benefits that Security Health Plan is the fact that we do have an integrated healthcare system with the Marshall Clinic. And so we can um, help to reach these individuals across multiple lines, whether it's whether when they're seeking care at the Marshall Clinic location, um, working through the family health centers that we collaborate with, or um, you know, as a Medicaid HMO, we can um, reach out proactively to these individuals as well. I think the goal here, of course, as Angela said in the beginning, is to help these individuals maintain their healthcare coverage, whatever that may be, whether it's Medicaid or an individual and family plan off the marketplace. Um, we want to keep this process top of mind. We are working from unknown dates and timeframes right now. So the more we can plan and prepare, the better. And um, the ultimate goal is to help these individuals, you know, um, receive the education that they need to complete this process when it's time and um, making sure that at the end of the day, um, we have individuals on our teams available to answer their questions. And one of the other things that um, I'm a part of is the uh, 
DHS and OCI partnerships where we're working on the education and outreach to these individuals in particular, we've been discussing what types of avenues we can explore to help this population when the time comes for several months now. And so the co collaboration of not just with DHS and OCI, but also the health plans that are part of those organizations are really going to hopefully help make this a successful um, process when the time comes. Thank you. Thank you all. We're going to do one um, other poll question. Um, Mike, if you want to throw that on the screen, and then we'll get to questions. Um, question number two, how well have you kept up with coverage policy changes during the pandemic? Um, very well, mostly well or not well at all. So we'll give you a very brief um, opportunity to answer this. And Mike, are we ready with the results? We'll give that just about another 15 seconds or so, and then we'll go ahead and close that. Great, thank you. Great, thank you. It sounds like most of you um, you know the coverage policy changes mostly well. Um, some of you are pretty expert at it and some of you are still learning. Uh, so thank you very much. All right, so um, let's get into some of the audience questions. Um, the first question I'm gonna ask and our, our panelists if they want to answer, if they could use the raise hand function, and I'll call on you know, maybe one or two of you. We may not get to all of you um, for each question. Um, first question, I'm noticing a trend to have zero deductible plans with co-pays for things like diagnostic testing and imaging. I don't know how to talk to consumers about these plans. How do we compare potential copay costs in place of a set deductible? That's a tough one. Does anyone want to take it? How do we talk to consumers, Kathy? It's a tough one. Um, it, it really is, and and you know, I think this is what gets what's really challenging. You know, and and we and I think all, all my colleagues would agree. You know, we we always want consumers to make really informed choices, right? To understand what they're buying. But we also know that that sometimes um, something might catch their eye, right? Like, um, be, and particularly because deductibles have increased so much. And as Aaron, I really like when Aaron used the word resorted, because you know um, consumers have resorted to buying these very very high deductible plans because they, that's the only way they can afford the premium. So when it comes to this, it does catch their eye, right? Zero dollar deductible, that's fantastic. And it is fantastic as long as they understand then how the plan works, right? Some people do like predictability in copay predictability because unfortunately consumers still can't find out how, th how much things cost. Um, so they like copay and the predictability of that. And that if that what is what draws them, then I think it's a good plan choice. You know that they can say, okay, it's three hundred dollars for this, and it's one hundred and fifty dollars for that. And if they like that way, and they're prepared quite often to pay those um, at the time of service, also because it's very predictable for the provider to be able to bill or to ask that for that money at the time of service. You know, then I think it could be the plan for them. You know, if they if they like that, and then of course all those copays still go to the maximum out of pocket. So they're going to keep collecting those copays, right, and paying those until the maximum out of pocket is met, if if, if that's even possible, right? Um, but then other consumers may may you know may may not want that, right? That pain every time that they have have a service and may be comfortable with the deductible and accumulating the deductible. So I think your job is hard. It's always been hard, and just trying to at least that they understand this the the concept of it, right? And and again, I think that other aspect of it will the providers, you know, more commonly than ask for that copay, 
you know, before the service, because again, the, the provider knows exactly what, what the, the patient's going to owe. So, you know, really again, education, um, you know, yes, $0 deductible, that, that does seem great on the surface, but just understanding what, you know, taking them through scenarios, you know, if you might have the service or that service or the service, <clears throat> what that might look like in terms of um, how, how they manage those costs. Great, Kathy, that was um, very useful. Let's move on to the next question. Um, and this, again, for any of you, um, did the additional subsidies, the increase in the premium tax credits from the American Rescue Plan factor into setting premiums proposed to OCI for next year? Does anyone wanna take that one? Tara, this is Angela. I can, Thanks, Angela. I can offer an answer. Um, so it, it didn't factor into premiums in the way that most folks would think, right? It's going to lower premiums because at the end of the day, the care is still going to cost the same. Um, and then I would also rem remind everyone, right, that the APTCs are going to be set off of that silver plan. So if the silver plan premium is going to fall, the APTC is going to fall, and then you have that experience of the member having more out-of-pocket cost um, to pay that portion of their premium. So my short answer would be no. The, the American Rescue Plan Act and the additional premium tax credits did not factor into setting the premiums for 2022. Great, thank you. That was a great explanation of pretty complicated um, topic. All right, next question. Are you seeing people who have purchased short-term or quote junk plans, probably online, and found out that they don't cover much at all? Um, do you do outreach to consumers um, to not get caught up in, in that kind of that kind of plan? And do you see those folks coming into coming into more comprehensive coverage? Um, this is Erin. I, I can chime in and just say from security's perspective, we haven't seen a lot of popularity in those plans within the region that we serve. Um, you know, we always try to educate our consumers on the comprehensive coverage that they can receive off the marketplace. And so, you know, we really steer them towards um, coming to us if they have questions and um, we can be that reliable source for them to help them get their questions answered. But I would say overall, we haven't seen a lot of popularity um, that may be different in different areas of the state though. Thank you. And I think we have time for one more question, um, if my clock is right. So um, last question, what communications do you send to your enrollees who may be or have been automatically renewed by taking no action through the marketplace? So people who've been um, passively re-enrolled, what communications do you, um, do you send to them? I can chime in on that one real quickly. Um, as far as our existing members, uh, we are required to send renewal letters that are um, very um, <clears throat> regulated by CMS. And so we try to highlight all of the new and exciting things that we're coming out with for the upcoming plan year, but those renewal letters will provide information on their new premiums, um, their plan design, you know, if they, if the plan design was changing, uh, what new plan design that would be crosswalk to, things of that nature. But um, in addition to that, you know, when they passively enroll, we want to make sure that they have all of the information about their plan that they're looking for. And so we do provide them with information about their overall provider network that they will have access to, the member handbook that talks about all of the different things that Security Health Plan put. Security Health Plan has to offer. Um, additionally, all of those value add perks that I had mentioned in my presentation earlier this morning. And so um, we have a whole um, packet of information that we make sure we get to them. And um, hopefully that helps with, you know, providing them with the education that they need about their new plan for the year. And thank you. Um, so there are more questions we're not gonna get to, unfortunately. 
Um, but we will send the unanswered questions to the panelists just in case they're able to provide um, responses. Um, the deadline on that, my friends, is Friday, October 1st. And if so, um, it, the answers will be shared to the web page so you all have the benefit of hearing more. Um, okay, and with that, I think that we'll wrap up. Thank you so much to the uh, panelists who, who helped us out with that. I learned a ton and I hope that everyone um, in the crowd did as well. Yes, thank you so much, Tara, um, and all the panelists. We really appreciate your time and all of your responses. Yes, we do have more questions we did not get to, as you can imagine. Uh, we'll be sending those out to you. So any information you can provide it, I know our attendees would really appreciate and we'll, we'll post it to them. Um, so thank you again. Um, you are ready, you can go. Uh, and I'm just gonna um, tell everybody we have a break now, 15 minutes. Uh, leave this link open um, to join the next session and we'll see you back at 1045. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Welcome back, everybody. Um, so we're going to get ready to start our next session. Hope you had a chance to just stretch your legs, get something to drink, get something to eat for those of us who like to eat our lunches early. Um, so this next session um, will be kicked off and moderated by Stephanie Sievers. Um, and I will allow, I will let Stephanie uh, introduce her panelists. Um, before I do, just, you know, again, a couple of reminders. Um, I know some people have used the raise hand function. We're not monitoring that. Um, so I, I think sometimes it's just done by accident. Just, just FYI, if you have a question, use the Q&A and not the chat. Same thing. We're only monitoring the Q&A. Uh, and um, just uh, so Stephanie is uh, a staff member with Covering Wisconsin. She is um, our health literacy and communications manager. And uh, I think many of you probably know Stephanie well from all the wonderful work she does. So I will hand it to Stephanie to introduce the session. Thank you. I'm still on mute. Thank you, Allison. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm really excited about today's uh, panelists and the, um, the topics that we're gonna be uh, talking about today. Um, so I just am not sure, Mike, am I showing my own slides? Uh, either way, I can either show them or um, if you would like to advance them, you're welcome to as well. Yeah, that's probably easiest. Thank you. Um, so I'll start that. Help me stay on track. Oh. Fortunately, um, I hate when the um, the Zoom panel covers up the button for screen to start my slideshow. <laughs> Okay, great. So today's session is special considerations when working with immigrant communities. And our panelists come to us from Bridge Community Health Center and the Monk and Hispanic Communication Network. So we're really, really excited to introduce them. So first I have Ailee Kerr, who is from Bridge Community Health Center. Um, Eileen is, is the community outreach coordinator there, and he's been a CAC since 2014. Oh, and also, I want to say that all of my panelists are bilingual, and all of them have been involved in their own communities and doing a lot of um, nonprofit type work uh, for, for many years. So I won't go into all the details since we have a lot to cover today. Um, and second, from Bridge Community Health Center, we have Francisco Guerrero. And he's a Spanish interpreter there, and he's also a CAC and has been since 2014. So we have a lot of experience 
for um, enrolling people from Bridge. And then um, we have Meng Zhang, and she is the lead Hmong coordinator for the Hmong and Hispanic Communication Network. She's also recently has become a CAC, and she is the interim executive director for the Wisconsin United Coalition of Mutual Association. And they work with stakeholders um, um, and refugees and the families of refugees in the community. Um, and I'd also like to introduce Mariana Savela. She is the Hispanic Community Coordinator for the Hmong and Hispanic Communication Network. And she will be a CAC. I know she's done most of the training. So fingers crossed, Mariana. So thank you so much to my panelists. And um, thank you for being here today. Let's see. So our agenda is to just do a brief overview of health insurance enrollment eligibility rules that impact uh, the immigrant community. We'll look at recent policy changes that will have some impacts. And then we'll move on to our panel discussion. So the panelists will discuss some successful strategies for reaching immigrant communities. And, you know, I want to, before we start on the slides, I just want to say that um, the immigrant community has experienced a lot of change and fear in the last few years. And uh, a recent survey found that most immigrants are still afraid to sign up for public health programs, such as health insurance, even when they're eligible. And so I think we have a lot of work to do to address the fear and to communicate uh, what, what people are eligible for. And we, we need to also communicate that these programs are now very much safe and will not impact people's immigration status. So I just wanna start with that. I think it's really important to, to think about how that fear has impacted our community. So first, you may have already heard, but I just wanna make sure everyone's aware that the changes to the public charge rule that happened during the Trump administration no longer exist or apply. What does this mean? Now, public benefits for housing, food, and healthcare are safe. They will not hurt anyone's immigration status. They won't hurt current or future immigration status. That also means that testing, treatment, and vaccines for COVID-19 will not hurt a person's immigration status. There is, this public charge rule is old. It's been on the books since, um, I believe, 1998. So there is still um, a public charge rule, but it only impacts uh, when someone uses long-term care to pay for a facility or cash benefits. So someone who receives cash benefits. So those two uh, benefit programs could negatively impact immigration status of the person using the benefit. And I just wanna say a side note is that the Biden administration is considering more changes to make it safer for immigrants to access public benefits. And they are currently accepting comments on that. So they haven't gotten to the point of proposing anything yet. They're just accepting comments. So if you're someone who is really involved and, and you would like to make comments, feel free to do so. Um, we, we do, uh, so Covering Wisconsin, as well as many other organizations are part of the Wisconsin Collaboration on Immigrant and Public Benefits. And, and they do have on the website, a web chat tool. There's also a WhatsApp text or phone text where you can um, just text the word support and you can go through um, various questions with people so that you can assure them and, and answer a lot of questions about immigration status and public benefits. And you can assure them that, no, really, these, these particular benefits are safe for you to use. So I encourage everyone to go to those numbers or the website and play with it a little bit. It's, it's quite easy to use. You could also scan the QR code. Okay, so I'm gonna get into the review uh, here and I'm, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time or go into very great detail, but just to sort of make sure we're all on the same page about who qualifies for, for which benefits. So um, with the two different programs, we have both Medicaid and Marketplace. Um, people who have some type of immigrant status have different uh, eligibility rules. So uh, first of all, with Medicaid, the language is US citizens or qualifying immigrants. And with marketplace, it says US citizen or national 
or be lawfully present. So I'm gonna go into a little more in depth with each of those. So who is a US citizen or qualifying immigrant um, according to Medicaid? So I'm gonna go over this list. I think it's really important, especially for, for people who are gonna become newly certified um, or licensed, I should say. So first of all, we have US nationals and that's pretty much just American Samoa and we have US citizens. And that includes Puerto Rico, Guam, US Virgin Islands, Northern Mariana Islands and naturalized citizens. And I think sometimes we might forget that. Um, I know I've certainly seen people from Puerto Rico try to uh, enter a bar and they show their Puerto Rican ID and they are like, this is not accepted. And indeed, Puerto Rico is part of the United States. So. Um, Puerto Rico and these other countries are indeed US citizens. Um, we also have refugees and asylees. And just to uh, clarify that, refugees uh, go through a process outside the United States and then enter as a refugee. An asylee enters first the United States and then asks for um, to be allowed to stay as an asylee. Um, and then we have different visa types, and there's several, but um, kind of a, a generalized way of thinking about them is uh, victims of domestic abuse or human trafficking, uh, permanent residents uh, with the, uh, the knowledge that adults have a five-year wait period, so pregnant women and children do not. And of special importance, maybe for the near future, is after Afghan and Iraq, there's a special immigrant visa holder. Um, and I think a lot of our um, newly arriving um, citizens from Afghanistan are probably gonna come under that visa. So it's important to know. And then um, granted withholding or deportation or, or removal. So these are common ones. There are more, um, it's not a huge list, but there are more. Um, I encourage everyone to, to print out that list and have it available for yourself. But. And again, when I say Medicaid, these don't include emergency services or prenatal services programs. So, and everyone on this list does not have a five year wait period except permanent residents. Okay, so it's gonna move my Zoom menu. There we go. So, Badger Care Plus for children. Children sometimes have some special rules, and it's important to, to think about them as. Um, separate from their parents in, in many ways. So um, we have a lot of mixed status families in the United States. So remember that children born in the US are eligible for Badge Care Plus, even if their parents are not. Uh, children who are qualifying immigrants, so such as someone with a, a permanent resident status, they do not have a five-year wait period. So anyone age 18 and younger. And again, remember public charge, even when public charge was active, Children's enrollment in Badger Care Plus or any public benefit will not negatively impact their parents' immigration status. Okay, so we do have a couple of programs through Medicaid that are available for um, either undocumented immigrants or immigrants who have not met that five year wait period yet. So uh, we have the Badger Care Plus prenatal program. So that serves pregnant women who don't qualify for Badger Care Plus, and emergency services. That's um, for immigrants with serious health care emergencies, but it has, it doesn't, it's not for everyone. It has a, a list of who's eligible. I'll go over that in the next slide. Um, and I do have a link in the, in the PowerPoint for, we have a, Covenant Wisconsin has a handout about these programs that goes into detail about who's eligible. And just a, <laughs> a side note, Immigrants who are enrolled in these programs during the public health emergency will remain enrolled. And so I'm not a representative from DHS. I cannot uh, give you more insight than that about how that looks or, or how they're coding for it, but um, it is something we have learned from DHS. So I encourage you to ask questions at a session uh, next week that's specific about Medicaid. Okay, and just a few details about emergency services because it, it, it's a little complicated. Um, it only serves some populations. So that's children, uh, adults 65 or older, adults with disabilities, adults caring for a child at home or pregnant women. 
Um, and you have to have a medical emergency as identified by a medical professional. Um, you can't be eligible for Badger Care Plus and there's income limits. And what's really complicated is that the income limits are different for different ages of, of children. Um, so we, this is a sheet we have, as I referenced before, the, the link is in the previous slide. So feel free to um, have that available to help you try to keep some of those facts um, straight in your mind as you're helping work with people. Okay, so that was Medicaid. I'm gonna move on to Marketplace. And thank goodness, Marketplace tax credits are not a public benefit. And you might need to remind consumers who are worried about impacts to a sponsor. Some of you might've heard this when people come in, they're sponsored to come here and the sponsor is legally responsible for all public benefits that they, that they um, sign up for, um, uh, financially responsible to pay back. So um, a lot of people are really worried about this. So just a side note. And so the marketplace lists eligible immigrant status as a US citizen or national or be lawfully present. So, Luckily for, for most of us, that, that, that's most of the immigrant community with the exception of, and, and the statuses of who can sign up are so long, it's easier just to tell you who cannot. Um, immigrants who are considered undocumented and people who qualify under the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, um, most commonly known as the DACA program. So as long as your status can be verified, the person likely has an eligible immigration status. And that is a link to the healthcare.gov website there. And the, the statuses also has a link to healthcare.gov that lists all the statuses of who can sign up for Marketplace. So immigrants who don't qualify for Medicaid, but are under 100% of the federal poverty level, can sign up on the marketplace. Um, and they often get $0 plans um, and, and really have very minimal uh, costs associated with that. So um, for example, that might be an immigrant who has a five-year wait period, you could send them up on the marketplace or any legally present immigrant who is not a permanent resident, such as students or professionals with work visas. So how do we help people who are undocumented or have DACA status. Um, it continues to be a challenge. Um, here are a few ideas. And I know um, Francisco has worked with a lot of people in the community. And so in the panel session, he can answer some questions about how some ways that he helps people. So in general, we can refer people to a community health center or a free clinic. We could check for community or charity care programs. Um, People with DACA status can sign up for prenatal program for pregnant women or emergency care if they fit the, the sort of narrow qualifications. And just a reminder that people with the DACA status can get employer sponsored plans and they can purchase private plans direct from a health insurance company. Um, and a reminder that if someone has an immigration status change, they that does uh, enable them to have a 60 day special enrollment period. So any point that that happens during the year, they can then um, change and, or, you know, um, use that period to, to enroll in the marketplace. Okay, and I have had um, some navigators who were there from the beginning and very knowledgeable tell me that they have found these, the, the resources from Health Reform Beyond the Basics to be really comprehensive and helpful. So I wanted to include that resource for you if you really wanna dig in and learn all the nitty gritty details, especially for those of you who might be serving um, immigrant community members regularly. And some of the things that they offer are webinars, resource guides, and fact sheets. And I was told that even just having uh, a printout of the sheet of all the different types of ID and where to find the numbers to plug into the marketplace can be, be extremely helpful, so. And there happens to be a webinar today at noon. So if you're not completely overloaded with information, um, that will happen live through Health Reform Beyond the Basics. And I did include the link here for you to, to register. And so my slide deck is already loaded on the website. So if you wanna um, reference it there. Um, that's available for you. And they usually uh, record those and upload them at some point. So if you can't make it today, <laughs> you can see it later. 
Okay, so I want to transition to talk about a new policy change and um, a proposed change. So first of all, um, with Medicaid, we now have um, people from the following three nations no longer have a five-year wait period for Medicaid. And I just want to say that if you're looking at um, notifications from DHS, they often refer to these three countries as the Compacts of Free Association or COPA. I personally didn't find that very helpful because I didn't know who were part of the Compacts of the Free Association. So I want to just identify the three nations and that's the Republic of the Marshall Islands, the Federated States of Micronesia and the Republic of Palau. Okay, and then we have some proposed legislation. Now I say proposed, it has not passed. Uh, we don't know if it'll pass, uh, but if it does, it'll have some uh, really strong impacts to the work that we all do. So this is um, called the Lift the Bar Act or Lifting Immigrant Families Through Benefit Access Restoration. And just some highlights from this bill that will really impact our work. It will remove the five-year wait period for all legally present immigrants who are Medicaid eligible. And it'll allow people who have DACA status to receive tax credits on the marketplace. So I guess I should have um, listed a link with some other information to, to learn more. But I will say that Covering Wisconsin and I'm sure uh, DHS and other groups will be sending out uh, information that if this does pass and, and how, how we can, what we need to know in order to do our jobs. Okay, so um, we're gonna go over just a few techniques that um, we think are important to, to have centered in your mind as we have the panelists talk about their experiences. So I'm gonna turn it over to Meng. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you, Stephanie, for this time and allowing uh, H2N to be a part of the presentation today. Um, we definitely use these techniques as we're working with folks um, in the underserved communities and uh, migrant populations um, here in the state. Uh, relationship building is key, right? No matter what you're doing. Um, it is so, so essential that when you are working with these migrant populations that you form relationships with um, the community partners or community leaders from these um, populations, right? That ties directly in with a trusted messenger when it comes to that relationship building. Um, it's it's going to be a lot easier um, and um, less of a barrier than to deliver, you know, whatever the message is and also to create that partnership or collaboration. Um, it's also going to really, really help with that warm handoff as well. So I, what I love about these like techniques, I guess, um, is that they all just go hand in hand with everything. Um, once you are you know, introduced to this um, community member from that trusted messenger, uh, that's going to be then the warm handoff, right? So that they know that they can continue to work with you um, and that they feel uh, comfortable, right? That's going to be a huge thing. Um, and also multiple touch points is really important. If they see you as a trusted um, resource from the trusted messenger in a community center, right? If you're, you're coming to the community center, you're there, you're a familiar face, they see you multiple times um, with other members of their community, that's gonna be so huge. Um, and that's gonna really strengthen that relationship building as well. Um, we have to go to where the people are. Again, that is so important. A lot of the folks that we work with have many barriers, um, especially in the healthcare system. So we wanna make sure that whatever we do is accessible, it's in their language. And again, that it's from trusted messengers in their communities. Um, I think I can go on and on and on about this piece, but um, I would love to open it to uh, Mariana or Ailey or Francisco to add anything they'd like to say about this. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I just noticed we have quite a few questions um, and maybe we should address those before we move on to our panel questions. So um, let's see, and I'm gonna ask my panelists to help me answer these questions as I am not a CAC. Um, let's see. If a pregnant woman is here with a visitor's visa, can they apply for Medicaid if they're visiting and staying for a few months? 
Does anyone want to take that? Maybe Francisco, do you want to answer um, that one? Technically, yes. Because um, if we think about the situation of uh, immigrants that are undocumented during pregnancy, they will be able to enroll for Medicaid because uh, in that situation, Medicaid will cover the baby, but not the mother. So it will cover the pregnancy. So if for X reason that visitor with a tourist visa end up in the hospital, she can technically apply for Medicaid because it will cover babies uh, during the time that she's here. Thank you. Um, and then let's see, I, I see some people are asking some really detailed questions about emergency services. Um, I am gonna document those questions because um, next week they're gonna really dig into some of these specific topics. So uh, please don't be offended if we don't answer them all. Um, let's see, here's a question. Is there documentation we should look for for refugees and asylees? Oh, that's a great question. Um, do, Ailia Francisco, do you have a lot of experience dealing with um, refugee populations or asylee populations and can give us some examples of what you see? I personally have seen or met people from Venezuela that is in the process for applying for uh, asylum. And technically they will, they go through the interview to get their uh, residency status. And then when they get that, they will be eligible to uh, apply for the Affordable Care Act. And then they will have like um, a permanent residency card that will allow them to do all that and then also social security numbers. So they will have all the paperwork from like a, a regular uh, permanent residence. Um, expiration date might be a little bit different for them, but once they finalize the application, they will have like a permanent residency card. Thank you. Um, uh, let's see. If you have an immigrant who signed up for Marketplace and her spouse has met the requirement for the wait period and is enrolled in Badger Care Plus, are they able to file taxes as married jointly? Married fi filing jointly? Um, in most cases, yes. I'll just say um, it depends on the uh, spouse's immigration status. But um, if they've met, the, if they're eligible for Medicaid and have made the five-year wait period, they yes, they, they should be able to just fine. Yeah, as long as the income level also met the criteria for by your care plus. <laughs> yeah, we, we didn't talk about the eligibility. It was more yeah, I was focused on the tax part, but absolutely. Um, Oh, here's a question. If, if you do have a family who um, is from one of those nations for COFA, the three nations, um, and the children are going to qualify, will the marketplace, and if the adults are going to go to the marketplace and the children to Badger Care Plus, do we think that the marketplace will know about COFA? I, I believe so, yeah. And if not, um, you know, get on the phone with them. <laughs> but they should. Um, if people are denied and they're eligible, they should always reapply. Um, I'm gonna, um, I'm afraid I'm not gonna address um, Michigan Medicaid. I would just, I mean, we can help you. Um, we're happy to help you try to find um, content for so that you can better understand um, Medicaid from Michigan. Um, we can do that at a later time. 
And I, I see that Julia has, Garvey has um, added her expertise. She says that she asked, what paperwork do you have that allowed you to enter the USA? And she says she may not recognize all the documents, but she enters the information in the marketplace application and she lets the marketplace determine eligibility. I think that's a, some great advice if you're not sure. Okay, so we're gonna head back to our panelists and give them an opportunity to answer some questions. So I'm gonna just exit out from it. I need to turn up my volume so I can better hear my panelists' answers. Okay, great. So um, I'm gonna first direct this to um, Ailee and Francisco at Bridge Community Health Center. So what challenges are creating barriers in the immigrant community right now? So what are you seeing that are creating challenges? Um, well, something I see mostly is again, family composition. And that's what gives us some questions to the families out where or how do I get coverage for my family with regards to healthcare. And they may have um, single adults in the household. They may have extended family, um, son-in-law, daughter-in-law. And um, I think we see this um, more in the Hmong community and maybe even the Hispanic community too as well. But educating them on the family composition aspect of how can those individuals get coverage, whether it's through their family uh, opportunities or get individual single adults to get Medicaid on their own or marketplace on their own. And this really has been a, uh, an important aspect on getting an entire household or uh, individuals in a house um, to get the healthcare that they needed. So that was a lot of educational aspect on what are these rules applied to and how is the household divided up? I, I imagine that's especially challenging when um, we all have different definitions of who my family is, right? Mm -hmm. Different generations, um, different relationships. Thank you, Eileen. Um, Francisco, did you wanna? Yeah, it's um, in the same, I think cost is one of the main barriers to access and in the case of taking in consideration how um, Hispanic families are uh, pretty much formed, uh, in some situations we have families that are part of the families here in the US and part of the families in, uh, in their own home country, either Mexico, Nicaragua. And here at the Bridge Clinic, we offer the sliding fee discount for those families because there is no other alternative for healthcare. But in order for us to count or in order for us to give them like the best discount, uh, is the discount is based on family size and income. And in most cases, all these programs that we can apply for, um, they need taxes to prove the family composition. Uh, we saw that at, here at Bridge Clinic, and sometimes they have family in, in their uh, home country that is not in their taxes. So if we know that, then we ask for the birth certificate of the child, so then we can count it also in the family, even though they're not in their taxes. Um, so that help us to provide better access at a lower cost which in, in the Hispanic community cost is always one of the main barriers, how much this is gonna cost. And if we can offer a, a bigger discount, that's the way that we're doing it. By also thinking in, in consideration the family that is back home. Wow, I imagine that would be a huge challenge. Um, you're helping to pay to support the family back home, but you cannot include that Mm -hmm. Help you get that bigger discounts. Yeah, and also because of before um, in the taxes, you were allowed to include the, the family that was in your home country. But mm -hmm. now you have to prove that the family live in the country for at least six months. So the taxes, which is the document that we use to verify family size, uh, it will not show all the family because of that new rule. 
Um, and then I remember, uh, Francisco, you and I had talked about um, another challenge you were seeing with um, H visa holders. So I don't know if you want to talk yeah, about Yeah, with the H visa holders, we have um, here in, in Maradon County, a lot of uh, ginseng producers are bringing uh, workers from uh, Central America. And even though they do have uh, a visa and a work permit, there is not many options for them to, to get the healthcare they need. Um, because in order for them to qualify for the uh, Affordable Care Act, they need to reconcile their taxes. But it's a, it's a temporary job, so it only lasts like eight months. So most cases, they come here before tax start and they leave before uh, it ended. So, um, and because of that situation, they will not be able to reconcile the tax credit under the Affordable Care Act, so they will not have access to healthcare. So then, then we go back to the same situation because it's only one worker here, the whole family is back home. If you count that income in the sliding fee scale, it would be too high of an income. So that person will not qualify for it. So we have to take in consideration the family that is back home. And as long as they can provide like per certificate, we can use that and then we can count the family as a whole. And then that way the sliding fee can be applied to the services they need. And it happened a lot in the case of patients that have like a chronic condition, in particular diabetes, that maybe they didn't brought enough medication for the eight months and now they need medication for, to manage the diabetes. If they go to any provider, that's gonna be like an emergency appointment in most cases. Uh, which can be very expensive. So we try to reach the places that have H2 visas to let them know that they can come here and then at a lower rate so we can help manage those chronic conditions by the time that they're here. Yeah, this was new to me. Um, I, I hadn't thought about what, what's happening with people who are here for, for shorter durations, but maybe come consecutively year after year after year, you know, the, this whole question of the taxes. And I, I'm pretty sure with H2 visas, um, employers don't have to take the taxes out for them. Correct. It's a, it's a, it's a choice. It's yeah, an agreement so between the employer and the employee, yes. So there's a lot of barriers for H2 visa holders. Yeah, and, and then around us, we have uh, Portage County that has a lot of uh, migrant workers that are in that situation. Um, in Maradon County, now we're seeing a lot with the ginseng producers and the pine uh, tree farms that we're seeing um, higher volumes of those uh, workers. And of course, uh, the south of the state uh, probably has a larger number. And then um, dairy workers don't apply for that and they cannot apply for H2 visa because it's not a temporary job, it's a permanent farming. So all those uh, workers, uh, we have to access them by trying to reach the farm. And usually it's when something hurts that they come to see you. Mm -hmm. and, and that's changed a little bit the dynamic of how can we approach those families. And it's also the same situation where the families are divided. The man is here working um, 140 hours a paycheck, uh, just him here. So 140 hours a paycheck is a pretty high income for a single person. So I think as community center, we have to think in ways that we can um, verify the family that they have in the home country. So a sliding fee can be applied in those situations. Uh -huh. Thank you for that. Um, and then I'm going to pivot now and ask um, Mariana and Meng, um, what are the challenges that are creating barriers in the immigrant community that you're seeing on the ground? And Mariana and Meng, um, maybe also one of you could define a little bit how um, the Hmong and Hispanic Communication Network uh, reaches people. Yes, thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Um, well, Mank and I work for the H2N, with the stands for the Monk and Hispanic um, Project Networking. And basically, we are reaching out to people going door to door. So we are reaching out to people going to those communities where they are at. We have seen, um, 
the, the challenges that we have seen in these communities in this area in Marathon County and central Wisconsin is that most of those families or communities um, work in farms, either dairy farms or um, man, some companies like a manufacturing companies. And they don't have access to sometimes transportation. Uh, the language barrier is a big one too, because even if we bring flyers from open enrollment and we communicate things, some of those people, um, they, they can't read in their own language. So they don't understand numbers, of course. Um, so we, we have to explain all those things to them. And with the H2N uh, project, that's what we are doing. We are going to them. We are uh, basically um, helping them, telling them about the resources. And so far, um, as Stephanie said, I am not certified yet. And we are referring people to Francisco on ILD in this area to help them with any of those questions they may have. But basically the way that we are also addressing these needs that they have or that we have to these challenges is, is doing outreach events. So we go, we talk to them, we educate them and uh, in a way that they can understand in a, in a level of literacy that they can, they, 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 that is easy for them and uh, we, can, we can help them. Thank you, Mariana. Uh, Meng, would you like to add something? Yeah, I will just add that I don't think there are enough bilingual CACs in the state. Um, language is, is and will always be a huge barrier. You know, even when um, somebody comes with an English speaking family member, they don't always know the exact translation either, right? And so we're always continuing this vicious cycle when it comes to language, but I know that we all try the best that we can. Even as a 34 year old bilingual woman, I don't know all of the Hmong vocabulary yet either when it comes to healthcare. So it's definitely a learning pro like process, but um, I would just say, you know, just be very patient and, um, you know, just keep in mind that we're all trying the best that we can to help, these, uh, you know, these families. Um, language transportation um, also has been a huge barrier. And I think also um, availability, right? Time availability of like the timeframes of when you're um, providing your services is also a, a, a huge barrier, right? Because if we have working families and they're only open at certain times, you know, they, they'll have to take time off to, you know, do these types of appointments. And so again, just making sure that you're very intentional as to where, when, and how you are providing services is so huge. And I think that COVID-19 has really brought that to the forefront as well um, when, it, when we're talking about barriers and challenges. So um, again, that comes back down to making sure there's multiple touch points and that you're working with a trusted messenger in, in these communities. Great, thank you. Um, I wanna add that I think what we do at Bridge Clinic is very crucial because what we've been doing is incorporating a cultural diversity into our onboarding process. So me and Francisco will go and uh, talk to every new staff that we hire, talk about the Hispanic community, talk about the Hmong community. How do we um, view or how do we uh, encounter healthcare barriers? And so this gives all new staff that same education on, okay, how do we help this particular community member in that particular demographic and in that particular environment? And I think this is something that uh, other organizations could uh, incorporate into their training to get all staff into kind of the similar educational aspect of how do we help our community according to their, uh, their needs. Thank you, Eileen. Yes, cultural sensitivity training is very, very important. Um, does anyone else have anything else they wanted to add for this particular question? I'm gonna to move to the next question. How do you reach people, especially during COVID? Since, you know, it seems that it's not going away. It's still here with us. We, we have to plan for it during our open enrollment. So how do you reach people? Um, I would like to um, comment on that one. So last year when, well, a year and a half has been since we got hit by COVID, um, here in, in this area, we started working with funds from 
United Way. Now we are working with funds from the Department of Health Services and from the CDC Foundation. And what we do is reach out to people in farms and, and those factories, but we um, go to those farms, we bring the flu vaccine, we are bringing the COVID-19 vaccine, we bring, bring education about um, health insurance, open enrollment, marketplace, affordable care act. Um, we personally have um, community health workers working with us who we are getting all this training and we are not the experts yet, uh, but we are educating com uh, community health workers to help us going and provide also um, just an overall um, idea of what uh, the Affordable Care Act and Marketplace is so people can decide. Uh, some people, they, they, they think um, the same thing that you mentioned, Stephanie. People think um, I don't qualify or my children don't qualify because this is a public charge. And I think we should um, like, like uh, make it loud and clear for people that if it, the, I mean, it doesn't matter what their statuses are in their whole household members, but some of them may qualify and uh, we should um, educate those people about that. Thank you, Mariana. Um, I think that um, I want to kind of refer back to the um, kind of onboarding process, the cultural sensitivity that Bridge Clinic provides. Um, I think having all of our staff knowledgeable on how specifically to engage particular family uh, community members and referring them to the right individual within the clinic or outside of the clinic that really provides a very uh, I think what mainly alluded to is a warm handoff and people are trusting that aspect of it and it helps them a lot to connect to resources that they need that they would have otherwise um, not know of. Um, Meng, did you want to? Yeah, I, I can definitely chime in. We've done a lot um, over the last year and a half. Um, you know, this summer when things were slowly opening, we were still um, masking up when attending um, community-wide events. Uh, so we did a pop, we've done a ton of pop-up clinics. And one of our biggest ones was at the Mon Wasa Festival here in Wasa. Um, every time that we we're out in the community, we try to really leverage our time and resources. And so, um, you know, as people are getting their shots, uh, when they're sitting down and, you know, they have that 15 minute wait period, we'll do surveys. Uh, we'll also provide an opportunity for people to, um, you know, maybe take a selfie and hashtag H2N and say, hey, this is the reason why I got vaccinated or whatever the case may be. And then we put them into, you know, a wrap, we do giveaways. We do so many different things, again, um, uh, just uh, in part of, you know, fun education, but also um, creating awareness and um, sharing real stories of people in our communities is so important. And so that's how we've been able to reach a lot of people. Um, you know, we've done a lot of community events as well. We've done school supply giveaways. And again, as people are coming in, we do COVID-19 surveys, we do basic need surveys, asking, hey, do you have healthcare? Are you interested in learning more? Um, you know, is there a reason why you don't have healthcare? We're really trying to drill down as to what the gaps are or what the needs are for all of our communities. And so, um, again, we, we really really feel like every, every touch point is a, an opportunity for education for our communities. And uh, we'll always try to layer that um, because again, we know that everything that we do is very layered and there's always that common ground and however we can really better leverage our resources and the community partner resources is so important. So that's how we've been able to reach people. Um, the Hmong American Center here also did food boxes and we know the Hispanic team did as well uh, twice a week. Um, so people would come through, it was just you know a pickup. But again, we would do paper surveys you know, QR codes in these boxes uh, for people to bring home with them. Uh, you know, we did flyers about COVID-19, about health insurance, um, as well in their language to bring home with them as well. Um, you know, we had repeat clients coming in asking about different things. And again, it's about, you know, making sure that we're providing them with things that resonate with them so that they feel comfortable enough to come back and ask us more questions. Um, and feeling like we are a trusted messenger, right? And that we can put them in touch with um, people who are educated and people who also speak their language that can provide them with an additional resource. That's really important. That follow-up is 
key to everything, right? Because once you do um, a good job at that, those referrals just start, you know, piling on all the time. Then we start getting questions about, oh, what about this? What about that, right? And so that's why it's so important for us to make sure that we're really connected and that all of our partners were all working together because we can give each other really good referrals because again, our community members need everyone's services, right? And so when we win, everybody wins. Um, and it's really about how can we better streamline all of our resources and again, um, making sure that, you know, folks who are needing these services are getting them. So that's how we've been able to reach folks during this time. On top of, right, like, um, you know, virtual workshops. And, um, you know, every week also I do a podcast on the Hmong radio here at the Hmong American Center as well. Um, I speak Monglish, I say, but I give updates about, um, you know, the weekly COVID-19 things coming out. I mean, it's hard to keep track of, right? But at least, you know, we try to be consistent. And so folks know when um, and where to receive these, up these updates and that they're coming from, again, trusted messengers and good resources. Um, so that they can get real time updates or at least trusted updates um, about everything that's been happening. So, great. Thank you so much, Ming. Um, and then I know that at Bridge Clinic, I don't know if I really want to take this. Uh, I remember you, you did some in reach. I think what we do with um, at the clinic is we, again, really making sure that our staff knows what's going on. Um, our screening team, our front desk staff are knowledgeable about who patients or individuals can go to uh, with regards to um, insurance questions. And our PFAs are very educational and most of them, actually all of them are CACs. So they know the ins and outs of uh, the marketplace and, market and uh, uh, Medicaid. So it's something that really connects uh, our staff together and connects the community members, whether a patient or not. And we've had um, plenty of individuals walk past the clinic and stop by for questions and then we end up helping them and then becoming a patient. Um, but I think the most important part um, I always allude to is getting our staff to be on the same page. And I think that internal referral of, I don't have the answer, but here's a staff that is knowledgeable in that part of it. Um, uh, that can help you. And I think that is by far our biggest success. And of course, there's always room to work uh, with that too, but uh, having our staff knowledgeable on the aspect of who does enrollment, uh, what does the marketplace timeline look like and having individuals that they can send patients to, that's been a very uh, important aspect of how we reach to people. Great, thank you. Okay, I'm going to move to the next question. Uh, what specific techniques have you found to be helpful in building trust with the community? So I don't know who wants to take this first. And actually, Stephanie, before we move on to that next question, we do have a poll question we will need to get to. Um, so I don't know if we want to do that after or I before did forget question. the poll question. <laughs> Thank you for the reminder. Um, let's do the, the one about... Um, fear in the community, Mike. So um, I meant to, to do this poll question earlier on, but um, if you could just let us know what, when you were seeing people in the community who um, are from the immigrant community, do you find that they're still worried about using public benefits or public charge? So that would be true, false, or not sure. Just to kind of give us an idea of the feeling in the community that you are um, seeing. And we'll give that about 30 more seconds and then we can go ahead and move on to the panel question number three. Okay, so it looks like 60% of the respondents said true, only 8% false and 32% not sure. So maybe you haven't had those conversations or you don't work directly with immigrant populations. Great, thank you so much. And um, 
Mike, if we could pause before we go to the next poll question. Thank you. Um, so moving on to panel question number three, what specific techniques have you found to be helpful in building trust with the community? So um, maybe uh, Mariana, do you wanna? Yeah, a, a big one that we have seen is like a, a person that looks the same as the community that you are reaching now, looking the same as you, you know, like I'm myself, I'm Hispanic and if I go and I reach out to farms, dairy farms, or where other Hispanic or Latin people is, um, they, they feel comfortable talking to me because I speak their language. We speak the same language. We look alike um, in regards to some cultural features, right? So I think that would be one of the biggest one because then um, they, they, they feel that they can trust uh, us or trust me, you know? Thank you. Um, Meng, do you want to answer this one? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, what's worked really best is um, the trust of messengers and warm handoffs. Those are always going to be, again, all of the techniques that I talked about earlier go hand in hand, right? But I think that's going to be really important um, on top of what Mariana has said, um, you know, making sure that um, there are truly bilingual people there. Um, who really and truly understands um, you know, the right communication type for the migrant population that you'll be working with. Um, doing that warm handoff, um, letting them know that you are a trusted messenger and really relationship building. Um, that's gonna be really key. Um, and it's so important. And, and I think what helps with that piece is um, providing the basic needs along with whatever service you're doing, right? So for example, if folks are coming in um to sign up for a food voucher then you know we do the surveys and we tell them hey next week we're also doing a pop-up clinic please make sure you guys come back if you haven't had your flu shot right and it's completely free you don't need ids or anything like that just come on through um that's really helpful too and again we try to leverage as many resources as possible and, and really showing our community that we're here to help and that we we are true advocates for them right so when you you, you start building that relationship in that way, um, folks are really going to um, be more open and telling you what they also need, right? Because again, a lot of times in migrant communities, it's a pride thing. And it's also um, not knowing if you can ask for help, right? Or not knowing if you can trust the person that you're asking help from. And so um, all of those things are really helpful and it's been really successful for our H2M team. Great. Um, and then uh, either Francisco or Ali, do you have um, some yeah, specific um, I could certainly chime in. So um, I've been lucky to be around for quite some time since the ACA first came out. And of course, times has changed now. But in, uh, in 2014, when I started working uh, with enrollment, we did a lot of education in the community. And that would be speaking to clubs, schools, um, the local university um, and other community events. And it's just being out there presenting to individuals. Uh, what we do now is we continue to connect with those partner organizations and they continue to know that, okay, this is what Bridge Clinic does, what services we provide with regards to health insurance or with regards to maybe the ACA. And I think that is a resounding drum where we keep connecting with these organizations and we keep uh, um, getting these referrals from them and we keep helping these, organ these uh, uh, community members to get the help. And I think um, from there on, you get the word of mouth. And I think by word of mouth is certainly is a big spreader of uh, what we do and how we help people in, uh, at the clinic. Great, thank you. I know Covering Wisconsin has also found that all of those initial education sessions uh, where have been very important um, because we still get referrals from presentations that were done five years ago. So <laughs> thank you. Um, Francisco, did you want to chime in? I know you had um, a project you had worked on um, with the, uh, I want to say the Rural Health Initiative. Yeah, we, um, uh, in Madison County, there was the Rural Health Initiative that was like a health assessment on dairy workers and agricultural workers. So we will go with them and when we'll assess diabetes or chronic conditions, then 
uh, we will uh, identify those uh, patients and right away I will start asking questions about their family structure, uh, documentation to see what best fit their needs. And then we will try to bring them to the clinic to establish them as a patient and then try to run all the all the tests that was needed at that point, especially when we identify patients with high blood sugar or high blood pressure. We, we knew that this is something that needs to be uh, addressed fairly quick, quickly, and we will start the application at the farm. And I will start like trying to find what is the best solution that suit that uh, family in particular. So um, connecting with those uh, external partners is definitely a way that you can enrich the, uh, the way that you're reaching out to these uh, uh, patients. And if you're not familiar with the Rural Health Initiative, they do um, uh, sort of health checkups, right? Uh, yeah. They go to individual farms and work one-on-one -on -one with people or with larger groups if they have a, yeah. a large farm with employees. Right. Basic health checks. Yeah, because one of the main barriers, because around here in Marathon County, uh, a lot of our Hispanic population works on, on dairy farms, and it's very difficult for them to be off work. So by going to the farm was really uh, a way to provide them access to something and then to guide them also and like, okay, these are the options that we can manage, that we can handle that are, are available uh, for you. Great, and that also takes care of some of the transportation issues yeah. as well. Because a lot of them don't, don't want to drive. So. I'll move on to the next one. How do you help connect community members who may be undocumented or don't qualify for help to other resources that might meet their needs? And I know you do this a lot, Francisco, so. Yeah, so first we need to identify all the options that are available in our region um, around our county and neighboring counties. And then as a FQAC, we provide uh, pretty much like primary care, but sometimes we need an MRI or a CT scan. So we need to know what other resources are, are available for us. And then uh, also by understanding the status of the patient, uh, documented or are undocumented, we know exactly where we can go with their needs. So we try to uh, provide all the resources depending on the needs that the patient needs. So for example, if we need an MRI, we try to help them fill the application with Marshall Clinic for their community care program. If they live in Wood County, then we try to refer them to Family Health Center for um, kind of insurance that they can apply for that's gonna help them to cover the services. If they live in Portage County, we try to connect them with La Clinica because it's, um, they have other resources that are closer for them. Uh, dental services, we try to reach to the Marshall Clinic Dental Centers if they are not in our reach. Um, in some situation for family planning, we go with uh, family planning here in Wasa, also that can help us with, because they also have a sliding fee application that maybe uh, it can work for them better. Uh, if we identify a mixed family where we have two members of the family that are undocumented, one is a DACA and another one is a um, citizen, then we have to bring all the ones, the DACA and the undocumented into a community clinic so they can get the care they need. And if they need anything further, we try to work with uh, local uh, healthcare centers to provide like an eye exam at the lower cost or uh, free glasses through different programs so once you're able to identify all the programs that are available, then it's a lot easier to provide the help they need. And once they feel that you are really committed to their needs, then they really trust, trust you. And then it becomes like a, a word to mouth, then more people start coming here because they know that we're trying to do our best to, to help them get the help they need. Yeah, um, I believe you told me you, you received calls from people from various parts of the state who have heard yeah, from uh, Bay, that you will help them Madison, figure it out. Milwaukee, 
And I asked them too, like, okay, where do you live? Let's figure out what is the best option for you. And once we're able to identify that, I make sure that I, I bring them here to the office to help them fill the application. And then, I, and, and then I submit the application for them too. So to make sure that the, the process goes through. Yeah, something you said that um, I think is really, really important for all enrollment assisters is to get to know um, all the resources in your community. And it's hard to be an expert, you know, yeah. not just in marketplace or Medicaid, but also resources. But um, the more that you can help connect uh, community members with resources that'll really help them live a happy, healthy life, then the more you become a trusted member in the community and, and yeah. the word of mouth will spread. So yeah, exactly. I think that's really important. So um, I know that I missed a poll question and um, I just wanted to do that really quick before we move on to some of the questions from the audience. So this is from the eligibility section of the presentation. So which immigrant status has a five-year wait period to enroll in Medicaid? Uh, so the first one is Afghan special immigrant visa holders. The second one is granted withholding or deportation or removal. Uh, the third one is refugees. The fourth one is permanent resident children. And the last option is permanent resident adults. And we'll give that just about another 10 seconds or so, and then we'll close that poll. Okay. Um, most people got it correct, and that would be permanent resident adults. It, refugees um, and all the other uh, groups do not have a five-year wait period. Okay, so I'm gonna um, start looking at some of the questions. Um, uh, somebody wanted to remind us about empathy and providing examples of real life experiences of other community members. Thank you very much. Um, wow, well, that one's really... Um, a Medicaid, some of the really deep Medicaid specific questions, um, I just wanna remind you that I'm gonna um, save them and those will be answered hopefully next week in the Medicaid specific section. Um, is there a webinar for us uh, border, I think maybe broader CSEs that would help give more insight on the Michigan, oh, I'm sorry, I already addressed that question. So yes, I'm sure there is something and we'll find it. Um, Oh, what are your suggestions on how to address the abundance of communication being sent to members, such as COVID plan information updates? I think that's an interesting question for our panel um, from Bridge Community Health Center. Does anyone want to answer that? Uh, which question was that? Um, how do you deal with um, members being sent too much communication? So about COVID, plan information, updates. We have to keep it simple because uh, culturally um, too much information is very overwhelming for them. So in, in those situations, we try to keep it to an Im immediate need. like. What is the information that's going to help us in the next month? And we focus on that and we try to avoid providing too much information because they're worried about other things beside themselves. The last thing that actually they're worried about is themselves. It's kind of funny because that's when finally they, they look for care. But uh, keep it simple in the way that short message because we also take in consideration the education level that some of our patients had. Um, some of our patients uh, don't know how to read English or Spanish. Uh, we have a lot of people that come from like uh, the countryside 
in, in Mexico and they speak a different language that is not Spanish even. So with that, we have to keep it very simple and very specific to what they really need. And we have to be careful not to use technical words to explain some medical things so they can understand what is important for them to, to take the medications or to go on to the appointments. And uh, otherwise, if we skip that part and we just provide a bunch of flyers, they're not gonna read them and they're not gonna pay attention to what is important for them. So I think it's the best answer is just keep it as simple as you can and really important to what is gonna happen in the first month and not for the uh, too long of a future. Yeah, I would also add to that um, how important it is to let people know what might be coming. If you know there's gonna be a large amount of communication, for example, from um, uh, Medicaid, you could kind of give them some update. You're gonna get some letters and it's okay if you don't understand the letter, you can bring it in and I can help you look at it or let them know what the letter's likely gonna say and, and how to respond. Yeah, I, I agree with that. It's being available for them because a lot of people bring to me the letters that they got from Medicaid or uh, the CAC or anything. And usually it's in, in English, or even sometimes in Spanish, and they don't understand what they say. But then we, we explain, OK, this is what they're asking. This is what we need to do. And let's, uh, this is the paper that we need to submit. So. Great, thank you. And I see that there was a question asking about um, how might the US government um, classify or uh, what kind of status would people who will be entering from Afghanistan? And, you know, it depends on each person's situation, but the large majority of people who are coming from Afghanistan would likely qualify under, it's actually a special permit, um, special, I can't remember the exact name, but it's a special visa specific to someone from Iraq or Afghanistan. So, and they do not have a five-year wait program for Medicaid. But they could, in some instances, come in as an asylum or a refugee, but um, they'll likely be under that, that specific um, status. Oh, and I have a request for the panelists to provide their contact info. So, um, I'm sure most, I think most of the panelists are really open to, to helping you navigate um, some of these uh, specific challenges. And um, I, it would be great if you wanna just type in your uh, contact information for those of you who um, are willing to do that. Um, I have another question here. They often run across farm workers who say they're here with a work permit. Are there different types of work permits? I bet Francisco has seen this a lot. I can say that, yes, there are different Yeah, ones. there is quite a few. <laughs> uh, but the one that we see the most is the H2, which is a temporary visa to work that expire in less than a year. And usually it's not longer than a year because it's temporary work. And we see that in a lot of uh, farm industries um agricultural work around our area a lot and that's the most common one but not the only one mm -hmm. yeah there are and, a lot of different work permits yeah. um i know and it's, um go ahead and it's tied to the employer with that visa they cannot be jumping from work to work they have to be working for the company that they they say they're working so it's very specific um, I know, for example, even um, approved status for um, VAWA, which is, um, I think it's Violence Against Women Act. Um, they have a, a specific uh, work visa. So there's a lot of different work visas with different um, immigrant status types. So, um, and it looks like Eileen might be typing about what language service is out there for support. Um, I know that in the connector tool, also, if you're familiar with that, um, Covering Wisconsin hosts that for Wisconsin. Um, it does list what languages um, different CACs or enrollment assisters or navigators might be able to help consumers with. Um, I think I've answered 
most of the questions uh, that we have time for. So I want to thank everyone uh, for, for joining us for, for this session, especially the panelists. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your on the ground work. Um, that's really important for our community. So thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you so much to this panel. Um, and again, thank you, Stephanie, for all this information. Um, I'm sure we could have gone on and on, but um, yeah. Um, and thank you, panelists, also for those of you who are sharing your contact information, and it's very much appreciated. Um, all right. Well, we are at the end of our conference day today. I did want to um, share the name of today's um, daily gift card drawing recipient, um, and that individual is Jasmine Smith. So congratulations, Jasmine. Um, and we will follow up with all gift card recipients. Um, send an email to your email to let you know um, uh, what's next with that. Um, so that's also it for this week. Uh, we will reconvene next Monday, uh, September 27th at 9 a.m. to continue the program. And um, I hope you have a great rest of your day, a great rest of your week. And thank you again. We look forward to seeing you next week. All right, take care.